like a gold standard or, or gold backed uh, or silver backed currencies are a new thing. These things have been around for, for ages. Uh, really what we're doing here is we're making it convenient and functional again uh, to operate in a modern economy. Welcome everyone to another episode of Inside the Markets presented by StockPulse.com. We are more than honored to be sitting down today with Nicholas Proughton, the Chief Operating Officer of Load. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us today. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, Justin. How, how are you? Doing very well. I'm excited to hear about precious metals, about cryptocurrency. First, I kind of want to dig into what you've been working on now for a while, Load. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Load at its core is a, a group of like-minded individuals that have come together to attempt to restore silver and gold to the monetary system, right? We had a gold-silver standard back in the day. During these times, historically, money was very, very well protected, moderately protected against inflation. Um, you know, the income gap was clo- uh, was smaller. And so, uh, you know, I think there has been this general sentiment in modern history to see a return to that, especially as inflation in the U.S. dollar has gone uh, haywire, especially in the, in the past year or so. Now, um, load seeks to achieve this by, by using modern technology with an old asset that we all understand, which is gold and silver. So uh, Load uh, creates digital gold and silver using blockchain tech. And, and, and that is where you get that stable coin or uh, gold and silver backed cryptocurrency from. So we have our AGX coin. Every AGX coin is one milligram of vaulted and, uh, sorry, one gram of vaulted and audited and insured uh, silver. And our AUX coin is our gold backed coin, which represents one milligram of uh, vaulted and insured uh, gold. Um, and then at the very top of the hierarchy there, uh, we have our load token, which is our, our, for lack of a better phrase, our equity asset that, that serves as sort of the governance token um, and is uh, how people are, are able to benefit from being, being stakeholders in the system. It's not altogether that much different from a conventional uh, stock or something uh, comparable to that, right? Uh, for holding these load tokens, users are able to uh, get what we like to call micro payouts. So the more gold and silver we sell out into the world through exchanges, through our mobile wallet ecosystem, uh, the more uh, rewards come back to you as a load token holder. So um, the bigger we grow, uh, the more you grow with us, which is pretty exciting. Um, the third element that, that load works on is, is making this digital gold and silver really practical. Um, so you could go to a shop today and uh, you could attempt to, to buy something with a bar of silver, or maybe a nugget of gold, and uh, you might be able to buy it if you're lucky, but you probably won't get much change, you know? Um, it's not really it's not really feasible because you're doing you're handling these these real physical assets. It's heavy. We're not pirates. We don't walk around with bags of coins anymore. Uh, you know everything is very sleek and modern. So what this payment solution and the payment solutions that that load works on um, uh, facilitate is is making this gold and silver truly liquid and functional. So merchants and businesses can accept it as a form of payment, or if they want to accept regular uh, US dollars, they can settle that into digital gold and silver to protect their wealth from inflation and really just making it as practical and as possible for users to use this digital gold and silver. So that's a very uh, a very surface level um, look under the hood of what who load it is and what we're all about. Um, so I'll, I'll put the ball back over to you, Justin. So perhaps say someone who maybe doesn't have a familiarity with uh, monetary history or perhaps isn't um, interested in gold and silver, but has nonetheless heard about experiments with digital currency in China uh, at the Fed as well. Why would you tell them that a gold or silver backed version thereof would be beneficial to them and really, I guess, uh, the nation or the world? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good philosophical question. Um, historically speaking, when, when you see um, money and power centralized into one small body of people, it generally doesn't bode that well for everybody else. And there's been lots of talks of government-backed currencies. There's ones in China, uh, and, and they've explored it in the Fed as well. But really, this is kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. The problem isn't the technology that they're using. You know, you can go and tap and spend uh, at, at a grocery store today with the U.S. dollar. It's, it's nothing. We don't think anything of it. But 
Uh, the problem is that the system itself is, is uh, inevitably bound for failure, right? The more supply goes out into the world, the value of the dollar continues to depreciate. And so even if you have it in this digital element on, a, on a blockchain, it, it solves effectively nothing. By going with a system like load uh, and using digital gold and silver, uh, you're, you're freeing yourself from this sort of system here. You can enter back into the system when you need to, but now you have your assets stored in a hard asset that has inherent value, that has had inherent value for thousands of years, um, two of the biggest commodities in the world, right? And this physical real world asset is stored all over in the world. So it's not beholden to one single government. Uh, it's very decentralized and we, we only use, you know, the, the best and highest quality vaulting partners um, to perform that service to protect our gold and silver. And then you have um, it on a blockchain, which means that it's decentralized, you own it, you own you are 100% autonomous uh, and separate from that. So you can never enter into a situation where uh, your bank account is frozen and you can no longer access your funds or something to that effect, right? So there's all these benefits and advantages to having uh, your silver and gold in this digital and decentralized format. Um, and I, I'm really just scratching the surface here. You know, uh, the U.S. is a really easy use case, but let's take a look at developing nations somewhere in the African continent, right? They've really struggled with currency for a long time. Uh, and, and by using something like digital gold and silver, um, you know, they're able to use a universal standard that, that is pretty much understood throughout the world, right? Many proponents of Bitcoin argue that the mining model there is uh, mimics that of mining gold. So I'm curious, what is the argument for a gold and silver backed cryptocurrency in, I guess, the competition with Bitcoin? Yeah, I don't really see the two as, as competitors, right? Um, the mining, <laughs> mining Bitcoin is kind of a, uh, I, I don't know if that was the best labeling in terms of a branding perspective, you know, what mining is with with Bitcoin and blockchain is essentially transaction processing. You hook your computer up to the system and you act as sort of visa interchange uh, to use a comparable system. And, and for providing that service and uh, you know ruining your computer's processors uh, from the amount of stress it puts on it, you get a little slice of the pie for that. That's what Bitcoin mining is. Um, and as to the competition, the sort of friendly competition that goes on with gold and silver right now, um, Look, don't get me wrong. Um, I think Bitcoin is fantastic. What it's done for the world is fantastic. I think it's well understood right now that it's a store of value. Um, it's a terrible currency. It's slow. It's inefficient. Uh, you know, based on what goes on in a day, your margins could explode or they could collapse in on themselves. And as a business owner, as an individual, just trying to run their lives, that's a that's a scary thing to watch. So I think there is room for both in the market. And I think that any sane investor wouldn't put all their eggs in one basket. Right. So really, uh, it, it's about, you know, having a strategy for your portfolio. And I think gold and Bitcoin have a, have a and silver have a place to serve in that. Can you speak to this competition you see between gold and Bitcoin in particular, um, kind of uh, take Twitter, at least by storm? We see, of course, Peter Schiff um, versus Anthony Pompliano and others. Peter Schiff has kind of become a, a meme in and to the Bitcoin uh, industry. However, I think at the end of the day, we're gonna see that there was a lot of love shared between everyone. But I'm curious, could you speak to this uh, gold versus Bitcoin debate, which personally I'll let you know, I think is misguided and axiomatically problematic. There is no competition here. These are, this is like saying that there's competition between oranges and apples. So can you speak to that? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I could, but you put it so eloquently to be honest. Um, yeah, there is more than enough room in the world for both. I think uh, at this point in time, they serve different uh, ni different needs and different purposes. Um, you know, gold may grow less um, explosively than Bitcoin does, but it's got thousands of years of monetary history that are understood about it. There's a certain trust level with gold that isn't going anywhere, right? And um, Bitcoin is awesome. Um, for you know anticipating that explosive gain that sort of um volatility there that has has created prosperity for so many people but there will come a point in time where maybe you want to take your gains you want to take some wins uh and gold is an excellent place to park that right when you're thinking about long-term preservation when you're thinking about 
um, you know, um, protecting protecting the the gains that you've you've accomplished for yourself. You know, gold is a really viable solution. So I I in my humble personal opinion, I would rather see people uh, you know take their wins in digital gold or digital silver than in uh, something like USD, where it actually loses value year over year, right? You know, the purchasing power of the United States dollar has lost over 90% of its value in 100 years versus gold, which has increased. So really, um, you know, why would you be putting your 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 wealth into that, into that in a, sort of as a storage? Um, you wouldn't. So um, in terms of the politics on Twitter, uh, I think you said it best. Uh, it really is, I, I think, media entities creating a buzz. I don't think in in truth, any of them are, are truly in conflict with each other. But it, what it does is it keeps both relevant in the news cycle. It keeps both relevant in the media if they can stir up this drama about it. But uh, like anything, like any news these days, I take it with a grain of salt. Did you speak to uh, the news as of late? So I guess a in two... In 2020, we saw approximately $6 trillion printed. We've seen another spending bill, I guess, called the stimulus bill um, passed. Can you speak to that and then where a gold and silver backed cryptocurrency fits into that picture? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, full, full transparency here, I'm a Canadian, so my visibility into American policy is somewhat limited, but we are a global company, right? Um, there's a lot of anxiety right now in the world. Uh, with with the uh, with regarding monetary policy, not just in the United States here in Canada as well. Inflation is kind of on the tip of everybody's tongue. Um, gold and silver play an important role for hedging against all this volatility that you're seeing and 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 the sort of rise of inflation. Um, you know, we work very very hard with um, regulators and with uh, you know governments to to provide a compliant and safe environment so that people can protect themselves in these uncertain and unwarranted times. Uh, and I really think that is is uh, the the core role that, that gold and silver can serve. I think once again, uh, it's not like a gold standard or or gold backed uh, or silver backed currencies are a new thing. These things have been around for for ages. Uh, really, what we're doing here is we're making it convenient and functional again uh, to operate in a modern economy. And so, you know, as we go out into the world, and as, now that we've got our regulatory feet underneath us. Uh, now we can now we can go and say, look, this is a viable alternative, uh, and and it's our hope, you know, in North America that people will choose to, you know, pay their employees in this digital silver or digital gold, uh, and in developing nations, uh, we we've even seen opportunities for it to become um, a serious economic force in terms of how uh, huge companies from telecoms to uh, you know, many other businesses are, are um, you know, servicing and paying and, and compensating their, their employees. So um, the, the really just scratching the surface of the opportunity on the table here, but um, we're talking about changing the fundamental relationship people have with their money and, and where their money comes from. And I think that's a really important thing to tap into. What type of individual or investor is interested in uh, gold or silver backed cryptocurrency in your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I think anybody who has an eye on um, economics, monetary policy, uh, and, and general concern about the, the state of the world has generally been uh, the type of investor that we engage with. Of course, we, we have a whole array of people. It's a very diverse uh, group of people. But the general underlying sentiment is that I, I seem, that I have seen and I think is understood is that uh, things are changing. Uh, what we're doing is not working. Uh, there are better ways of doing things. And uh, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, so people are looking for alternatives. And when they come to the project, they see something viable. They see something that has a, a proven history, which is gold and silver, and they see it uh, married with the bleeding edge of innovation. And it seems like a very um, serendipitous marriage of the two, right? And And so really... I would say that this project is for anybody that that um, is a looking to build a system that is for people by people. B wants to you know play a role in changing how we engage with money and how people store wealth. And uh, C anybody who's uh, really interested in the next leap forward for for gold and silver. Right, I've spoken quite a bit about how this can be used as money, but even if you're just a speculator and you just want to buy some gold and sit on it. Um, the, the calling it a cryptocurrency kind of complicates it. At the end of the day, it's still gold and silver sitting in the vault. So 
you know, even just in this, this brief description here, I've given you a few different types of people who are interested and really there are so many more, but those are kind of the core that we see coming into the project. Can you tell us what it's been like straddling these two industries, the precious metals industry and the wider cryptocurrency industry? Yeah, I was like, you know, why don't we take two really complicated things and do both of them at the same time? <laughs> That's kind of just been the overall sentiment. Um, it's It's been fun though, don't get me wrong. I love a challenge. Um, as I said earlier on in the in the call, uh, we've worked really, really hard with regulators all over the world, the European region, in the United States, Canada, uh, even in El Salvador, Latin America, the list goes on. Uh, and every time we come into these regions, we have to be conscious of what the what the politics and what the regulations are with respect to um, cryptocurrency and blockchain in that region. Uh, makes it a bit tricky. There's no one uh, shoe fits all. And then, of course, um, gold and silver is also very similar. You know, there are VAT taxes and regulations around gold and silver in uh, Europe. You know, there are rules about uh, silver and gold leaving the country in in Indonesia or in places like uh, Mexico, right? Um, so uh, we have to be very mindful of these of things, uh, which means a lot of the time walking before we run. Uh, I know that that's kind of the antithesis of what, a lot of what you see in the cryptocurrency space. You know, let's put, let's make a meme coin, let's get Elon Musk in on it, let's bump on an exchange, and let's take the ride and handle the lawsuit later, <laughs> which is you know antithetical to what is kind of the, our our business methodology, right? We've really gone a slow, arduous approach, but now that we've done that, you know, four years into the project, uh, the the turnaround that we're seeing is pretty incredible. We can barely keep up with all the business that we're doing. And it's nice to have that security and comfort that we're doing things in a safe and compliant way. Can you speak to, I guess, El Salvador's legal tender law for Bitcoin and what that implies for that region, if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's extremely progressive, um, right? This is a country that uh, among many in Latin America that were really struggling with uh, hyperinflation, uh, something that you know uh, a few years ago seemed impossible here in the North, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have their eye on today. Um, again, a very, very, very progressive. And we've actually had the benefit of speaking to uh, some representatives from the government of El Salvador. In fact, we are continuing those discussions today. Um, and uh, it just blows me away how open to uh, new ideas and new progressive ways of, of handling monetary policy are, um, are coming to light. I know, for example, right now that they are, are working on um, regulation that will allow for uh, DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations, for those of you who are familiar, um, uh, which is another uh, sort of hot uh, buzzed uh, topic in the crypto space right now. Um, so. You know, I I think um, they're sort of the proving ground. If they can pull it off there, I think other countries will be, uh, especially developing nations, will be quick to adopt similar methodologies. Uh, so we have high hopes, and we have high hopes of uh, you know bringing what we're doing with Load to El Salvador in a big way in the new year. Are there any other jurisdictions that you experience as being a progressive like El Salvador? Yeah, I mean, uh, lots of Latin America um, is is really open to the idea. I think right now everybody's just trying to find the way to do it right um, because there's um, all this uncertainty around the decentralized component compared to traditional state currencies where are, they are, of course, centralized and are operated by a single um, a, a single government. Um, so, you know, that that plays an interesting role in things. I do think to a certain extent, places like Switzerland have been very progressive as well. Um, you know, uh, Load has a, a, a series of companies that it uses to operate in different regions um, so that we can remain compliant. And Switzerland was one of those places that really gave us um, a good foothold from which to launch into the European region. So, you know, tip of my hat to them, Liechtenstein, um, Estonia, there, there are several places throughout the world that have been very uh, responsive uh, to uh, the development of crypto. I would argue, uh, for better or worse, North America, Canada included, has been somewhat of a, a Luddite um, and, and unfortunately not very um, progressive when it comes to uh, creating new policies for people to adapt. I mean, heck, I've seen interviews uh, with regulators in my own country where, where they barely can comprehend the internet. So now they're trying to wrap their heads around blockchain and it's slow coming. But, uh, you know, uh, as I said before, uh, if El Salvador can pull it off, I think it will set the foundation um, for a lot of the world. Palantir, Peter Thiel's company also bought gold 
whereas Tesla and MicroStrategy bought Bitcoin, claiming that they were hedging themselves against a uh, black swan event. Any thoughts on that? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think, again, it, it plays itself into this whole idea that something big is coming. Uh, I'm not a, a big believer in, um, in um, sort of like definitive moments where it all happens all at once. You know, it's not like it's an earthquake or a tsunami where it kind of just wipes everything out in a single go. I think we're in the middle, you know, or the beginning of, of what these companies are expressing and their concerns are. They see a lot of uncertainty in the world, uh, in, in the geopolitics and the economics of things. And they're, uh, they're, they're hedging their bets, as you said, right? So I don't know, know necessarily that it will be, um, you know, uh, a one singular thing. Uh, I think it will just be um, sort of a transition of a thousand cuts to use a, a somewhat of a metaphor. You know, you've probably heard of the phrase of death by a thousand cuts. So the system and the way that we are doing things, I think everybody is clued in that it is changing and everybody's trying to figure out how to adapt to it. Uh, during this period of time, you know, um, people, people are going to look to alternatives and look to safe havens. And, and that's exactly what these guys are doing. We've had the honor of sitting down today with Nicholas Proughton, the Chief Operating Officer of Load. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for joining us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Justin. It's been an absolute pleasure. For those of you guys who are actually interested in learning a little bit more about what we do, wanted to connect with me directly, please head over to load.one. Again, that's L-O-D-E dot O-N-E. Uh, you can find all of our social channels there. And right now we're actually doing a special little giveaway um, for people who like and follow our Twitter posts. So if you want to learn more about that, you can head over to Load Pay Media on Twitter and again, L-O-D-E dot O-N-E. Thanks so much again, Justin, and take care. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you everyone for tuning in for this episode of StockPulse.com's Inside the Markets.